the uh, plenary session. I'm Marco Scioli, I'm chairing uh, the session this afternoon. And um, uh, we start uh, our presentation with uh, Yannick, Tang Tang Yannick Tangui, uh, who works at the French Space Agency. And uh, um, uh, I leave the floor to Yannick. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I hope you had a nice lunch and uh, not too tired for this last uh, afternoon. So it's a great pleasure for me to present uh, Orpheo Toolbox. It's a roadmap for the next years, uh, and I hope we will have uh, some uh, discussions after that. Um, first, I present myself. I, I'm, uh, I, I'm Yannick. I work, at, uh, I work in Toulouse at CNES, the Space Pension Agency, which is a big uh, technical center. Uh, we're out uh, near uh, 2,000 uh, engineers working in uh, every field of uh, uh, space system. Um, especially, I work in a remote sensing area uh, in a department where we are interested in uh, extracting uh, valuable information from images, uh, all kind of uh, optical images and also SAR images. So today, it's a talk about uh, Orpheo Toolbox, which is a quite an uh, old tool. You may know, I think, uh, Orpheo Toolbox, some of you. Uh, and we'll try to, to present uh, some uh, outlines on uh, future versions. So, short reminder for those who don't know uh, Orpheo Toolbox. Orpheo Toolbox is a library of uh, applications for remote sensing. Um, that can do for you almost all the tasks you, you want to do on uh, satellite images or uh, optical images or cellular images, from full processing to extracting uh, information, for example, with segmentation or classification framework. Uh, Offer Toolbox is more than 15 years old, but it was easiest to, to, to find a, a nice uh, cake uh, with a 15, uh, <laughs> 15 years. <laughs> uh, and um, it has been uh, funded and developed mainly by, by Ness, by my company, uh, for in the frame of a program. Of a program was um, a program to help people uh, use a very high resolution imagery of uh, Pleiad satellites in uh, 2006. So it has been developed since, yen, since then, and uh, it couldn't have been developed uh, without the help of a very uh, good uh, libraries like uh, GDAL, like ITK, because uh, OTB is kind of an uh, inheritance of uh, ITK. ITK, for those who don't know, is a um, uh, medical image processing library, and there are a lot of common things between uh, spatial image and uh, satellite image and uh, medical uh, images. Uh, from nearly the beginning, uh, Orpheo Toolbox has been an open source software. It's uh, on, uh, under Apache uh, license and uh, is a member of uh, OSGO since uh, 2017. It has been uh, developed uh, to for maximum reach, that means um, to address both uh, small studies, when you work on uh, small, small images, to uh, big data, uh, time series and so on, also to address uh, both scientific and uh, operational uh, work. So a few words of, uh, on uh, very high imagery, high uh, resolution uh, imagery. Uh, it has been designed, as I said, for Pleiad, but in fact it can handle uh, all, almost any, any image that, can, that uh, JEDAL uh, can, uh, can read. And for pre-processing, uh, the idea is that uh, most of you maybe used uh, some reference data, some uh, analysis-ready data, but when you go from uh, the world satellite data to uh, this uh, calibrated uh, image, you need to pre-process uh, images to remove uh, atmospherical effects. You need to auto-rectify to georeference image. Uh, you also need to, uh, to merge uh, for example, here the high-resolution panchromatic image with the, uh, the less defined uh, multispectral image. This is kind of magic. Um, also, uh, at CNES, uh, OTB is a kind of building block for uh, big uh, data processing chains and distribution uh, services portals. As you know, Copernicus Data, Sentinel-2, 1, uh, etc., are distributed by a lot of uh, platform of hub. Uh, at NES, we have two, two services that uh, compute and deliver this kind of, uh, this kind of data. And uh, our photo box is used in a processing chain to remove, um, uh, to detect clouds and also to uh, calibrate image and uh, remove atmosphere atmospherical uh, 
effects. Sorry. Um, it's also used in uh, big uh, processing chains or framework to compute uh, level three uh, data, like uh, this uh, land map, uh, land cover map. Uh, and uh, every year it's used uh, to compute uh, this kind of map over France and you have to deal with uh, hundreds of Sentinel-2 tiles, a uh, lot of dates, and so it's a big uh, amount of data. Uh, our uh, toolbox is also used in a lot of uh, academic works and uh, every, every year we see that uh, people uh, produce articles and uh, have used our uh, toolbox for their studies. So we are very... Uh, we're fan of that, and uh, since we gave uh, training sessions, I think we have uh, we gave about uh, 30 training sessions uh, in conferences, uh, like uh, the the one we gave in Phosphor-G uh, on Monday. So from uh, a few hours to uh, two, or three, or four, or five days of uh, of training, and it's an occasion to to meet people and to build this uh, this user community. Of course, uh, we, every, every time we come at Phosphor-G, we, we meet a lot of, uh, a lot of people, have a uh, very nice discussion. It's a always a pleasure to meet you. Uh, we also organize uh, our own uh, user days, every year, every two years, it depends. Uh, it's an occasion to, to try to understand what people do with uh, our software, to drive uh, the roadmap and uh, and that's the subject of the discussion of today. So, wow, that's a huge elephant. It's a huge and a little bit elongated ele uh, creative common elephant. Um, and uh, as you see, some people may think that uh, really uh, OTB uh, became maybe too big. Uh, we had a lot of uh, people having difficulties to install uh, of a toolbox in their Python environment. Uh, a lot of people um, do things differently than uh, five or ten years uh, before, so uh, we, we, we have to adapt. Um, we think that maybe we support too many, uh, too many operating systems, like uh, different flavors of uh, Linux, uh, Windows, into versions, Mac OS, and it's a lot of work to, for, for the maintenance. There are also many dependencies because uh, there are like 20, 20 libraries uh, in the uh, Orpho Toolbox build, so it's a uh, lot of job to follow all the, uh, all the versions of the libraries. Um, and in fact, the, f the thing is people uh, do things uh, quite differently now. Uh, people, uh, even at CNES, uh, develop a lot of tools in Python and not more in, uh, in OTB. But we still have to, to keep uh, OTB alive because it's used in a lot of, uh, lot of uh, subjects. Um, and so we, we wanted to, to discuss with the users to find ways to um, have a, a better maintenance of a free toolbox. We made uh, user surveys during the COVID years. Uh, the user days uh, in uh, 2021 at the end of the year, and uh, now we have a quite clear idea on uh, where we go. So that's uh, what I'm going to, to present, because what I didn't say is the fact that we like elephants, and we don't want to put uh, elephants in the zoo, so here are some solutions to, to save it. Okay. Um, I realize that it's quite impressive, like in a <laughs> few texts, it's big. So three axes, simplify maintenance. Uh, that is, in fact, a chance because it can um, help us to focus on the core features of a, of a toolbox. I mean, no need to, to go further if uh, there are a lot of tools that uh, do the things better than us. But on the core features, it's uh, important to, to maintain things uh, in the right way. And also, the, the other thing is to better integrate uh, Offer Toolbox with Python. Um, that's what we plan to do for the next session. So, first of all, we are going to remove uh, some uh, graphical interface. It's, uh, the best part is to rem remove code, simplify build. And we have already started that. In fact, we had uh, graphical interface in Qt that were uh, um, sometimes hard to maintain, even if they were automatically uh, produced, generated. Uh, we had also a very nice uh, imagery work called uh, Monteverdi 
Monteverdi was very efficient to open uh, big images, even, uh, I think, more efficient than, than Gédal, but uh, Monteverdi only um, processed uh, raster image, uh, not all other kind of data. And uh, now, almost every people use, uh, use QGIS. So we plan to drop all these and instead promote uh, QGIS integration, um, OTB in integration in QGIS. Uh, a few years ago, we improved the plugin because there were some, uh, some little bugs that prevent uh, people from doing things uh, correctly. So, so now it worked fine. Um, during the, um, the workshop Monday, people uh, could have uh, tested it and uh, it's working fine. It allows you to, to launch every application you have, uh, you have installed. Um, other aspect, it's uh, macOS. I think macOS is quite used in the GIS community, but not much in remote sensing. And uh, according to the survey we made, there were less than 10% people using macOS. And for us, it's very hard to maintain because uh, they change their architecture. Uh, the continuous integration is very uh, complex to, to set up. Um, and in fact, we don't have any users at CNES also of our macOS, so we decided to drop it, but to offer a Docker image. And uh, the Docker image is compatible with the two kind of architecture, ARM and uh, Intel. So it's, uh, it's fine and uh, better for deploying uh, OTB if, if people want to use, uh, use macOS. Second part of the, our strategy, our roadmap, is uh, trying to go uh, toward a more modular offer toolbox. That means that at the time, at now, if you download offer toolbox, you download almost uh, 100 applications. You can also install some remote modules. There are tens of remote modules. Some of them are maintained uh, quite regularly, other are not. Uh, so that's a lot of applications. Maybe we'll use uh, six or seven of them. Uh, that's also a lot of dependencies to package. Um, if you want to compile it by yourself, it can be uh, quite complex depending on the system you use and, uh, and so on. And so we want to split uh, this, uh, big, uh, this big of a toolbox in uh, several packages. The first, OTB Core, uh, will contain uh, the, the main applications that, may, may, that we may use the core features that, are, that differentiate uh, offer toolbox from other uh, libraries. And we will have, for example, uh, an uh, OTB machine learning or something like that, that will contain uh, machine learning algorithm because even if a lot of people do machine learning with OTB, if you do it with another library like scikit-learn, it's fine and uh, you don't have to install uh, OpenCV and, uh, and so on. Uh, the idea is that uh, all of these modules will be uh, deployed as uh, easily as uh, unzipping the archive in your directory and uh, you will immediately have access to the new applications and we will try to do the same for the remote modules uh, in a way that uh, if um, certain kind of uh, application or certain module uh, are less used, we could put them as uh, deprecated or maybe as a remote module and don't give the same uh, maintenance on, on it. And it, will, uh, it can uh, ease the maintenance and uh, ease uh, the, the, the build. The idea would be, uh, our dream would be to, to uh, kind of uh, pip install uh, OTB, but uh, it's not, uh, not yet possible. But, uh, we we'll hope that for the users, the experience will be uh, in this kind of experience. Um, last uh, aspect is uh, trying to have a more Pythonic uh, interface. Actually, the, uh, from now, the interface is like that. If you want to, to uh, use Offer Toolbox in Python, uh, here uh, we have uh, three applications that are plugged in the pipeline. So uh, no file is, is written or rather this except the input and the output file. So that's quite fine. It's efficient, very streaming and so on. But it's uh, quite verbose and uh, not very Pythonic. Uh, so some developers uh, prefer some uh, lightest interface. Um, but we have uh, some uh, people in our community, Rémi Cresson from INRAE, who uh, developed um, a very nice uh, wrapper called uh, PyOTB, um, which uh, wraps, in fact, uh, the existing interface uh, with a more Pythonic um, 
Pythonic uh, functions, and uh, this is um, the way we could we could have wrote uh, the the previous example. So it's uh, it's easier to to use. It's nicest, and maybe uh, we will we will integrate it in a near future. Um, the other thing about Python is that um, p a lot of people complain that uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to install it or to integrate with Python, but in fact, there are only some, uh, some locks that need to be uh, documented. First, uh, the compilation of uh, Python bindings, because uh, OTB is uh, delivered with uh, compiled bind uh, Python bindings, and it's quite easy to compile uh, Python bindings. I think uh, in a few in next version, we will do it at the install step. But uh, from now, we uh, just document it properly, and uh, it could be enough for a lot of users. Another thing is the um, JDAL uh, Rastorio issue. I mean, if you use uh, Rastorio, for example, that depends on JDAL, you will have conflicts if uh, you don't use the same JDAL than, uh, than Northflow Toolbox. Uh, conflicts if you want to import both, uh, both libraries. But there are some... Um, some ways to uh, to pass to to solve that problem, and we we had uh, added uh, these uh, these uh, tips in the documentation so that users could be could benefit from uh, better integration. Uh, last thing is integration, for example, with uh, NumPy. Uh, it's possible since a lot of version, but uh, people don't know uh, always uh, how to do it, and there are some uh, the, the older example were not uh, not so not so adapted to a real case. So we, we improved the documentation, and so now from the cookbook you have a, a more uh, uh, more relevant information on that. So this was uh, the way we, we think to, um, we are going to improve uh, integration. Uh, now a little state of uh, actual version. Uh, the OTB 8.1.2 is being released uh, now. The release candidate has been released, uh, the tag has been put like uh, end of uh, last week. Um, to remind you the recent versions, in fact, the, the 8.0 version was a big, uh, a big version when we remove uh, dependency to OSIM. We were only using a small part of that library. It was heavy, yeah, heavy to maintain. And now um, OTB is uh, uh, really um, powered by GEDAL for reading and uh, managing a digital elevation model, for example, on part of uh, metadata management too. Um, the first 8.0 version was uh, has some problems of uh, computing time, so uh, we have two, two versions to correct some things, and now auto rectification is uh, faster than in a previous uh, seven, uh, 7 version, so it's, uh, it's quite cool. Um, as I said, we have an official content, uh, Docker component and, uh, and some doc issues. And coming soon, uh, the 8.2 version will integrate a uh, new JDAL version and will integrate the full support of uh, Playad Neo. Um, on uh, OTB uh, 9, uh, we'll uh, drop the graphical interface, drop Mac support, and uh, we'll, um, we'll bring uh, the, the, the modules that I talk about. I think about eight or nine, uh, nine modules. And uh, in the next, uh, in the version after, we will, uh, I think, improve the Python, uh, Python API. So that's nearly all. Uh, the thing is that uh, if you, you don't know if you want to contribute, there is place uh, to, to contribute. Place for, uh, for contributors, for documentation, for uh, testing, validating everything. For, uh, if you want to, to discuss of the strategy of the roadmap, you are welcome. Um, so we have uh, different ways to do that. Uh, if you want to start OTB, the, the good entry point is uh, the main website on uh, its documentation page, the cookbook. If you want to discuss, uh, to share your experience, you, you are free to, to go on the user forum and uh, post, uh, post a message there, and uh, the community will, uh, will answer you, will, uh, will discuss with you. And we have our own instance of GitLab where you can uh, connect and uh, contribute anything and um, also find uh, the, the remote modules that work with uh, our toolbox. I think I'm on the time. So thank you very much. Felimin, uh, Felimin de Derit. Oh. <laughs>
And uh, maybe next time we'll meet uh, in the Pyrenees, uh, hiking and cycling if you want. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the, um, the public? Maybe someone is interested in some specific things or... No questions? You sure? Don't be shy. Thank you. Can you speak to um, the OTBTF development, the TensorFlow? Is that integrated into the future versions of the standard OTB library? Uh, it's not integrated uh, yet. Maybe we should uh, discuss with uh, Remy because uh, OTBTF, for those who don't know, is a remote module to uh, prepare data for TensorFlow uh, learning and prediction. Um, it's a quite a valuable remote module. And uh, even if it's not the core uh, domain of, uh, of a toolbox, it could be maybe uh, at least promoted uh, in a better way, maybe integrated in the documentation. And yes, yeah, so this is the kind of thing we, we, we could discuss in the future of VSN2. Okay. And uh, if, you, if you use it, uh, I'm uh, glad to, to hear about your experience. Absolutely, yes. I use both, in fact. We could talk, yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you. Any other? Thank you, Yannick. Very Thank good you presentation. Very much. <laughs> Just uh, some minutes, so we, we, we give the time to the people to come here if they're interested, and then we start at the right uh, uh, timing. start in four minutes the next presentation.
factual. Okay, we can start if you want. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to introduce the next uh, uh, speaker, who is Robert Coop, is the head of Technology of Coordinates, and is involved in different uh, projects uh, uh, since uh, a lot of years. So I just uh, leave the floor to Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had some uh, mix-ups with. Uh, presentations because, hang on just one second before things go bad. That's better, it's got the right conference on it. All right, I am Rob, I'm from Coordinates. We're a geospatial data management platform and we're trying to crack GIS data out of vendor silos. So you can host, manage, share, publish, access, and build apps on top of data. And we really make it easy for professional micro anglers to find and access geospatial data and get on with their jobs. And that's making decisions, building maps, creating models, developing applications. And on the flip side, we help facilitate publishing data. Um, what I want to talk about today, though, is visioning. So. How many people kind of consider themselves a developer or spend some time developing software? So quite a lot. And besides having to try and make computers do what you want all day, you're pretty lucky. Uh, you can actively work across multiple tasks and projects and switch between them. You can have different um, development and release branches. You can do things like code reviews and pull requests so that your colleagues can uh, collaborate across it. And this, this is what makes open source work as well, right? That we can collaborate efficiently with people who aren't uh, in, in larger groups and who aren't necessarily all together. And a developer can take for granted that they can always see who changed what and when and if they're really lucky, why. And developers use these sorts of things every day, but, but in respect to data and geospatial data, you just can't do this. And we talk to our users, and they say we want this, and so that's what we're trying to do. And we have some more opportunities as well, right? And so uh, we talk about working between different ecosystems is really important in geospatial. So we have our open source ecosystem with projects we love, like PostGIS and QGIS. Uh, we have people and colleagues and customers and suppliers who work in uh, the ESRI ecosystem, uh, or maybe the application, like the web developers, and they don't really do geospatial data. And so in the engineering world, they work in CAD. All these different ecosystems are a little bit disjointed. And when we go between them, we often have to convert data, and our expectations are different. If you're a, a government agency publishing data, you will do it in your uh, national grid, because that's, that's what you do. But whoever's using the data might want it in something completely different. And every time we have to do these conversions, it adds, adds friction to getting updates. We can also do things like uh, data integrity and being able to verify that I have the same thing as you is really important. And looking at uh, what I've written here is like supply chains. and so. Um, I get data from somebody else, and maybe other people get data from me, and how do we see where this data has come from? So what are we trying to do with CART? So CART is uh, built on Git. Uh, we decided to focus our effort on data and geospatial, and we can leverage other people who are in the, in the software world who focus on the, the underlying building blocks that, that we're using as part of Git. We want to maintain compatibility, so, so CART should be familiar to anyone who's a developer, but it, it won't necessarily be identical. We want to make it easy to install, uh, so we include all the batteries. 
and it works on uh, Windows and Linux and MacOS. Coordinate system handling works, database connections work. We, we try and make it work out of the box. And we want to make it for practical day-to-day -day use. So this isn't really a solution for people who have their own satellite clusters producing terabytes of data every few hours. They have software teams, and they can develop tools specific to them. This is for the rest of us. So I'm going to do a very quick demo now. I'm going to look at what a cart repo actually is, and then we're going to have a look at making some changes. So what we've got here is uh, QGIS. And if we look up on the left-hand side, then we can see our data browser, and we can see some layers that have been added. And from QGIS's perspective, a cart repository is, is just a geo package or just a directory with some images in. But see my mouse cursor. OK. But what we can do is uh, make some changes to these things, and then we can look at history. So uh, over here, we've we found a problem with our data. And uh, what we're going to do is like select it. I'm going to say, who added this weird island thing? Select it over here, and then we're going to delete it. Let's see if the delete key works. Ah, I'm going to edit first. This is really hard on a giant screen. Wrong layer, of course. There we go. Hey, oh, come on. You can do it. Yeah, delete it. OK, so we can uh, save our changes in QGIS. And so we'll see what happens next. From QGIS's perspective, this is just a layer, right? So uh, over here, we can uh, go to uh, our repository. And let's have a look at what our repository is. And so I've cloned this from a workshop that we did earlier in the week. Uh, and so we've got a few files here. We've just got our geo package, .g package. We've got a terrain directory, which has uh, some uh, tiffs in. And we have a VRT file that cart automatically generates. And what we can do now is just do cart status. And cart can tell us that da -da 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 -da. Uh, one, one uh, delete has happened, and we can uh, commit it. OK, so we've made a change to our repository. And that's, that's great. We can also see what the history is. So we can see that um, I've deleted a change. So that was my most recent change. And then Hamish maybe made some changes a few days ago, which might have been uh, adding that. And we can go back through time, kind of see what changed. And we can view differences as well. So I'm going to go on and talk about our um, cart plugin, our QGIS plugin, a little bit later on. But that, that's a really easy introduction to some of the underlying building blocks. So we try and build on top of existing file formats. So in this case, our what we're working with here is a geo package and, and some TIFF files. And if you're in a different ecosystem, if you work in the ISRI world, it would just be a file geo database. Or if you're working in a CAD world, not that we have it yet, but uh, DWG files and stuff. So I talked about our vector and table data sets we support. And so uh, we have kind of 0 to 100 gig, which is pretty big. And uh, we try and follow a SQL model. So we have a schema. And you can change your schema over time. And that's OK. But you kind of have to assign data types and columns. And we, we pull in all this stuff. And we input from many OGR formats. We know about coordinate systems. And one of the cool things that we can do is re-import from a snapshot. So if somebody sends you files every few uh, weeks or every few months, you can keep loading it into the same repository, and you build up a history of versions that you can then compare and see what's changed. We support point cloud data. And uh, we build our point cloud data support on cloud-optimized point cloud. And I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later on. And again, it's kind of zero to terabyte size data sets. And we do things like use the brand new support for creating uh, virtual point cloud files. 
so that uh, from QGIS's perspective, you can just open the data set and all the tiles are treated as one tile for styling and uh, performance purposes. You now support rasters as well, and that's built on top of cloud optimized GeoTIFFs. And for both point clouds and rasters, we, we don't store the data itself in the repository. It lives in um, like an object storage system, like S3 or something else. And the reason we do that is to enable um, what's stored in the repository itself is the information about the tiles. So where they are, what the coordinate system is, how many bands they have, maybe some statistics. And then it allows CART to uh, selectively um, alter stuff without having to, to make big duplicate copies. And one of the things that we're going to be able to do soon is to be able to point CART repositories at object stores that already exist. So you don't have to copy your data into CART. So we have this concept of working copies. And that's where you work and edit your data. So before, when we were in QGIS, we saw that we had a geo package file, we had a directory, and we have different, uh, different working copy formats for, for different places. So you can put data from your cat repository straight into PostGIS, and we'll keep updating it as you switch around between branches and revisions. Uh, you can do the same thing with Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, um, I already talked about Esri, and we've started using the cloud optimized formats for um, point clouds and rasters. And the idea is you can, we can start serving tiles and uh, stack and other things from the repositories. But being able to do a, any revision back through the history of all the changes. Uh, we've got a cart QGIS plugin. And the QGIS plugin is the panel you can see on the right. And that allows you to uh, navigate the history of the uh, repository. It allows you to make commits from within QGIS. You can roll back. You can switch branches. So you can do this sort of stuff um, natively from within QGIS without having to use the command line. Something else we support is spatially filtered clones. And what we're doing here is working only with your area of interest. And so if I'm a data publisher, I have a, a national data set. That's how I want to publish my data, right? But if I'm a, a, a local user working in a specific city or town, that's probably the only area that I'm interested in. And I shouldn't have to either work with a, a much larger data set that has lots of information that's not relevant to me. But at the same time, I shouldn't have to divorce myself from that data set. So what we try and do with spatially filtered uh, clones and, and working with spatial filters is to be able to stay part of the larger repository, including all its history, uh, editing, updates. But what you're actually working with locally on a day-to-day -day basis is just a, a filtered view of that. And so when I make changes, I'm pushing and pulling to the full data set. Uh, but when I open it up in my software, in, in my PostGIS, or in my QGIS, then I only see the, the area that's kind of relevant for me. And so this is obviously something that uh, we've built that isn't really relevant to, to Git or something else. And so this is what I mean about we can focus on features like this that are important to our users, rather than uh, kind of reinventing um, parts of Git that that other people have already done. And so I've got a small demo of that. We'll see if we can um, make this work. So what I'm going to do here is uh, clone a data set. If you're a Git user, you kind of recognize what I'm doing. 
this is the point where you're like, I didn't realize I was going to be holding a microphone, so I'm like, one finger typing a really long repository name. Now, this is a USGS point cloud data set. And we're going to hit the button, and it's going to clone down. And the first thing it does is collect all the information about all the tiles in the point cloud data set. And then it kind of figures out what it needs. And so what it's going to do is go away and, and figure out that it needs to transfer quite a lot. I think it's about 10 gig, 146 files. This is never going to work. It's OK. We have spatial filtering to the rescue. So I can uh, specify a spatial filter when I'm pulling a clone down. And we can do it uh, in different coordinate systems. We can do it as WKT. We can do it as files. So in this case, I've got some WKT in a file that defines a little box. And whoops. There. So I added a spatial filter, and it's doing exactly the same thing it did before. But instead of pulling down 146 files or whatever I decided, it's going to just grab two, maybe three. And this is going to go a bit quicker. And the Wi Fi is working. This is great. And so you can imagine for. Um, like a national or continental size data set, this is going to make a huge difference. So uh, let's go. go into here. So each data, each data set for point clouds and rasters is a directory. And in this case, it's the Agua Blanca fault in Mexico. And we can see that uh, we have three COPC layers files. And uh, we have a VPC. And so given that spatial filter, um, it's decided that that's the only thing that's relevant to, to the area I want. And so cuts just pull down the data it needs. And we can go into QGIS. And we will go into our folder. Maybe I can move that away. And we've got a um, I'm going to create a new project because it's going to be a somewhere different. And we can uh, it knows about CRS. We're going to set the project CRS from that. We can a 3D view. There we go. And as we zoom in, uh, we can cut. Uh, QGIS will now quite happily load the tiles um, incrementally. We can do all our QGIS stuff, and we're working with a smaller subset of the larger data set. The really cool thing about VPC, and the same with VRT, is that, and really good work to Hobu and the Lutra guys for, for adding it, is that we can keep, uh, from, from the desktop perspective, we're working with one layer in QGIS, and Cart can update it in the background. If you change your filter, it will pull down some more data or throw away some data. Um, but from QGIS's perspective, we can treat it as one thing for styling and, and stuff. Should get back here. So I guess what's coming up in the last year, we've uh, been steadily trucking away. I said we added raster support. Uh, point clouds were very, very new last year. Uh, we finished off a bunch of work around documentation. Uh, we now have much better help on the command line. Uh, the tools is faster, generally. Uh, we fixed a lot of bugs. And we're kind of making steady releases with uh, new capabilities and uh, just general improvements. So I talked about before, we want to reference data from existing S3 buckets without copying. So if you have a, a S3 bucket with lots of Cloud GeoTIFFs in, uh, what we want to be able to do soon is just point your repository at those tiles, and you can treat it as a cut repository. 
we already submit multiple data sets in a repository. So these are four uh, basically different layers and different tables. And you can add in, uh, obviously, rasters and, and point clouds as well, and keeping them together as a project. But what we really want to get to is looking at interlinking data sets from projects, because often um, the data you're coming from is coming from different suppliers. The data you're getting is coming from different suppliers. And so we want to interlink it so that you can have a nice, compact project repository with the layers you're interested in, regardless of where they came from, and to be able to pull in updates from where, from other repositories really simply and easily. We know how to do that, and we just uh, need to build it out. We want to be able to blend local and remote raster and point cloud data sets. So if you've got data that's, um, as I said, like a national uh, raster layer, you might want to have some tiles locally because it makes your day-to-day -day life a lot quicker and easier. You can uh, run analysis or do models on them for the relevant areas. But maybe you want to be able to at least see the other data sets uh, by pulling them directly from the cloud as well. And we want to be able to serve tiles and APIs like Stack directly from repositories and supporting all the history, right? So that we can look at different tags, we can look at different branches and uh, different commits in this history and treat it all sensibly uh, via Stack and tiles. And that's basically what I had to demonstrate today. Um, one of my demos was going to be a little bit longer, but <laughs> such is life. Yeah. So Hamish and I are here from Coordinates. Um, Hamish is weaving over there. We're totally happy to answer questions. If this is the sort of thing that, that kind of pikes your interest, if you're having issues versioning data or versioning is a struggle or working and collaborating with other organizations on data sets, pulling in updates, if these are familiar problems to you, please come and talk to us. Um, we'd love to learn more about what use cases people want to solve with CART. Um, and we're really uh, excited about helping people pick it up and, and work with it as well. And you can obviously find us at uh, uh, the website. You can email me. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any questions, uh, curiosity? Please don't be shy. Uh, I think it was a very interesting presentation. Sure, yeah. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, Card seems to work very similar to Git. Is it possible to host it on a service like GitHub or GitLab? And the next question is, imagine that you have a vector data set that has, let's say, 1,000 commits. Is it possible to check out only the last snapshot of the repository? Thank you. So the first question was around where we can uh, host. So a cart repository is a Git repository. And yes, you can push it to GitHub or somewhere else. And if you run your own uh, Git hosting infrastructure, it will work with cart. If you have really, really big repositories, then uh, there are some optimization tweaks you might want to do. Um, at Coordinates, we're starting to uh, figure out how to offer cart hosting. So if you're interested in that, talk to us. But we don't, this is an open source project. It's, we want everyone to be able to run cart and to be able to host cart and to be able to do everything else. Um, but right now, if you're, if you're picking up and you're experimenting with it, definitely just push to GitHub or push to whatever you're getting host. You're not going to see it on the website view, but cart will work totally fine. The second question was around, can we just look at the, the latest commits? Um, so this is, in Git, you call this concept uh, shallow cleaning, and we support the same thing in cart. So what we've been doing over the last uh, year is we have um, quite a lot of data at coordinates, and some of it has um, uh, weekly updates for like 15 years, 10, 15 years, and we've built repositories that uh, have that full history in. Um, and yeah, it can make quite a significant difference to be able to pull down and just look at the latest one, and we definitely support that already right now. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Up the back. Yes, that is right. 
Uh, hi, I just caught the last few minutes of your talk, so hopefully this is not going to be a stupid, naive question. But uh, you said it's basically like Git, so an idea came to my mind. Is there a similar workflow to uh, like in Git bisect when you're trying to find uh, some data with cart? Can you do something like that? Uh, I haven't really thought about that, but I don't really see why not. So we can display, um, detect, well, show changes between any two commits or revisions, and that's kind of what BISEC does, is just trying to like narrow down where something came from. Um, and so I don't particularly see why, why either it couldn't work or couldn't relatively straightforward to add. Yeah, thank you. As far as I know, Cog format is not designed to be extended. So you write once and you cannot modify that. So what are you doing to modify this? Are you copying the whole file, getting huge? What do you do with the overviews? Are you recomputing them all? Yeah, so right now we're kind of being, the cog, the rest of layers we've traditionally been working with are uh, tiled to some extent. And so if you decide that your tile is broken, then yes, you will create a new one um, for a new change to that tile. But mostly raster and point cloud data is, um, in terms of these data sets that you're pushing and pulling around, a lot of them are going to be fairly read-only. Not necessarily for, for people doing lots of editing and models and stuff, but um, in terms of the data distri distribution part and reliably getting data to people, then uh, that's kind of our initial focus. There are opportunities in future to, um, I guess, handle that in different ways, um, but we haven't gone down that path yet. Any further questions? Apparently not, so thank you for your presentation and uh, thank you very much. We are going to wait uh, three minutes to start the next one, so we leave the people. Uh, Just some minutes to, to make people switch from the from their Apparently, yes, they just had to, to reboot it because they, uh, there was, yes, and they are going to reboot it. Uh, you, you, you already uploaded uh, your presentation. Yeah, they downloaded so it here to yeah, your yeah, computer. No, I think it's okay. I mean, they, they just have to reboot it. Just start of the live timing, so the people yeah, can yeah, yeah. get through. Yeah.